When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you're looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. So they said to him, What can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. So they said to him, What sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, as, is, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host. We're glad that you can join us today. What can we do to accomplish the works of God? <clears throat> Good question. The answer is not that difficult. The problem is not enough people are asking the question. What can we do to accomplish the works of God? What do I need to do to be secure in my retirement? What do I need to do to bring more joy to my life? What do I need to do so that I can be happy or I can be fulfilled? You realize what a restlessness there is out there? And I've mentioned this before. And you take people who have made it. They're rich. They're famous. Everyone knows them. They get seats of honor everywhere. They have more money than they can spend. Wherever they go, people recognize them. So why do they commit suicide? Why do they overdose on drugs? Why are they so miserable? I once had a friend of mine, a restaurant tour. Big deal. I don't know, 18, 20 restaurants. You know, more money than he would ever spend in his lifetime. And I called him Christmas Eve to see if he was coming to Midnight Mass. No, I'm just staying home. What are you doing tomorrow? Nothing. Why? Well, my kids are with their mother. My girlfriend's with her children. And I'm just going to be home by myself for Christmas. Well, look, man, I mean, you know, look, we're going to have 40, 50 people. You probably have to eat off paper plates, but why don't you come join us? No, that's okay. Now, we own some of the highest quality, best restaurants there are, and he's probably opening up a can for Christmas Day, sitting there eating out of the can by himself. 
Wow. See, when you ask yourself that question, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? <clears throat> what is it that we do? And more often than not, people focus on what are the things that I do to bring me great success? What are the things that I do to acquire more than what I already have? What are the things that I do so that other people are going to think I'm important and famous? And you get there. Now, in, in my local town, this name, everyone knew him. A well-known name. Plenty of money. No happiness. What do I do to accomplish the works of God? The thing that I do to accomplish the works of God is the same thing that the Son of Man did to accomplish the works of God. You put the people that you love ahead of you. You worry more about their happiness, their well-being, than about your own. No greater love than this exists that a man should lay down his life for those that he loves. And more people will tell you their greatest joy in life has been their children. Because that's a group that you are willing to lay down your life for. That's the group that you are willing to do without in order that they may have some of the things that they long for. You are willing to do without so that you can give them the education, the opportunity, make the sacrifice to do that. And those are the people that are really, really happy. <clears throat> Way too often, I've had the tragic reality of being by a parent who is by a children's deathbed. And when, when they pray, they said, Lord, please take me, leave them. I mean, and we know that. That's not, it's not rational. It's nonsensical. It doesn't work that way, but trust me, they meant every word of it. And in a heartbeat, they would have traded places with this child that they loved more than they loved themselves. And so when you ask the question, what is it that we do to accomplish the works of God? It's imitating Christ. And, you know, a lot of people think that imitating Christ is walking around with a silly smile, letting people take advantage of you, just kind of being a doormat for the sake of the kingdom of God, and loving everyone, even though they step on you and push you out of the way, and say, God bless you, Realize what our Lord did. When you really love somebody, you can be honest with them. Lord, these sayings are hard to hear. Are you going to leave too? Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. For the woman caught in adultery, you poor thing, you had such a terrible life. Your mom and daddy were no good. No wonder you turned out this way. Does no one condemn you? Nor do I condemn you. But from now on, go and avoid this sin. Get out of the business, okay? Stop working it. He didn't simply make excuses for people. He loved people enough to tell them the truth. 
He invited them to the Father's love. He invited them to the Father's mercy. He invited them to the Father's forgiveness. And that enabled them to do the works of God. Having been steeped in a life of sin, he didn't say you're good for nothing and you'll never amount to anything. He invited him to the Father's love. He invited him to the Father's mercy. And he invited them to change their lives. So oftentimes, people misunderstand what sacrificial love is. Sacrificial love is not just taking all of it and smiling through it. Sacrificial love is loving someone enough to stop them. Loving someone enough to not tolerate the things that separate them from God. How many times have you heard parents say, well, you know, I don't like it, but as long as my child is happy, I'm happy. They may not be doing anything closely remote to the will of God. They may not be doing anything to work for their salvation. But you say things like, as long as they're happy, I'm happy. You know what, darling? Thank you for playing. But that's the wrong answer. That is absolutely the wrong answer. The thing is, is if you love your children, and be it your children, your spouse, your co-workers, the people in your circle of life, if you love them, then you're gonna, you can bring them to the truth, and you can bring them to God. And you're not going to say, well, I don't agree with you. As long as you're happy, I'm happy for you. No. As long as you're pleasing in the sight of God, I'm happy for you. If you want to give up everything and go live in the missions <clears throat> because you feel a call to serve God through these indigenous people who have no hope, no water, no anything else, be happy for them. Don't be happy for the people whose lives are completely contrary to the gospel, completely contrary to what God asks of us, steeped in sin, and we say, well, I love you, and I'm happy for you. You know, if, 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 if you love me, stop me. Don't let me do drugs and say, I know you really get off on this, and, and, and everything is great, so as long as you're stoned and you're out there and everything's good, I'm happy for you. Don't do that. And don't do it with their moral life. Don't do it with their personal life. Love someone enough to invite them to the truth of God. What are the things that we do to accomplish the works of God? The things that we do to accomplish the works of God are to live very committedly that sacrificial love. It's not the silly smile, and I'm happy if you're happy. It's calling people to the truth of, God, of the gospel and loving them enough even to let them hate you in order to save themselves. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bayou from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that would is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not gonna bring you the truth of the gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey's over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. 
So they said to him, What sign can you do that we may believe in you? What can you do that we might believe in you? Hello and welcome back to Close Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. You don't love me. You, all my friends are getting to go to this party. You don't love me. All my friends have these type of sneakers. You don't love me. Have you ever gotten to the point where your kids become, they hit puberty, they become teenagers, and you really wish there were some gypsies around that you could sell them to, you know? They just don't get it. They just don't get it. I was so upset. My dad never made my little league game. No, he never made your little league game. He left out of the house at 5.15 every morning. He didn't get home until a little bit before 7. He had an hour and a half drive each way. And he worked his behind off day and night. And just because your dad wasn't at the ball game, you say, he doesn't love me like all the other dads love their kids because they went and watched them strike out every time. It's amazing. You never give me anything. Oh, yeah. All the other kids get to go to the movies. I have to stay home and clean my room. You never let me do anything. They were going to the party, and all their mamas bought them a new dress, and I still got to wait. On and on and on and on. You know, most parents say, you just wait. One day you'll have your own kids. Then you'll understand. There's a lot of truth to that. There really is a lot of truth to that. You know, my aunt used to always tell me, she said, the worst thing about being a parent was when I heard the words come out of my mouth, the same thing my mother said to me, and, I, and I, when she would say that, I would hate her. Well, if all the other kids are going to jump off the bridge, you're going to jump off the bridge? You want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about. All those things. And the woman says, and I'm at that point in life where every time I open my mouth, my mother comes out. That sort of thing. Of getting in touch with gratitude getting to the point that you really do understand what everyone has done for you. Mom, I don't know how you did it. Y'all raised seven kids. I mean, I've got these two, two kids, and they're driving me crazy. I don't know how you did that. You know, and then Dad just didn't have that good of a job. It's amazing all the things we got to do with as little money as you had raising seven kids. I have two children, and I don't know how you did this and did that and did the other. Yeah, right. Sometimes there is no replacement for experience. Sometimes there's no way until we find ourselves in the own, our, that same situation that we can appreciate and understand what the people who loved us went through for us. Some people never get it. Okay, some people just never get it. You know, I've got cousin who's one of ten children. And they always felt that their mother never gave her enough individual time. I get it. She had ten children. You know, it's not like, come on, Susie, you want to go walk in the park? We're going to leave the other nine kids here to tear up the house and I'm just going to take you to the park and tell you how wonderful you are and how beautiful you are and how, how nice your hair. It doesn't happen. It's a sacrifice you make. It's the things that you do for the people that you love. And that understanding, that understanding and that gratitude for what people have and what people have done for us, I don't think we oftentimes get it until we're in the same 
position ourselves. And that statement, that's okay. One day you're going to have children of your own, and then you're going to understand, you hear? I think sometimes we do that with God. I think sometimes we just think that, you know, I was on God's short list for some reason. God didn't give me everything he gave everybody else. I haven't been as blessed. I have friends who have this, have that, have the other thing. And maybe we're not talking about material things. Maybe we're talking about talent like singing or musical ability or athletic ability or academic ability or any of those. And we think, why didn't God give me this? Why didn't God give me that? Why didn't God give me the other thing? You know, and I've said this, and, and I promise it's not going to be from the rest of my shows, but when you lose a parent, you really understand how much that parent did. I, I got to say that my brothers and sisters and I really understood that about my mom and dad, you know, long before my dad died. But you really understand. You really understand how much they did, how much they did without, how much sacrifice they made. And when you start to understand it, and when you start to imitate it, then you start to understand God. And then faith becomes much more real. Remember the first segment? We talked about what are the things that we do to accomplish the works of God? And it's not running around with a religious goods store, you know, on a chain in the middle of your chest. It's not about carrying a Bible under your arm at all times. It's about being able to imitate that sacrificial love. It's about getting to the point where you love to the point that you're willing to put the people you love ahead of yourselves. We certainly saw that with our parents. And when we realized that with our parents, then we were able to recognize God in our midst. Because that's the ultimate sacrifice. That's the ultimate no greater love than this exists than to lay down your life for those that you love. And that was literal. That was absolutely literal. And so when we start to talk about what are the things, what can you do so that I might believe in you? Well, the things that we do are just look around. I'm one of five kids who grew up in the 60s and 70s. And none of us are drug addicts. And none of us got killed in accidents. It's pretty good. That's pretty good. All of us are in our 60s and above and we're still living. None of my brothers or sisters have ever been divorced. All five of my brothers and sisters go to church at least every Sunday. And most of them go frequently during the week. And I wasn't raised in a church that my mother and dad were, were church mice. They had to work. They had five kids to raise. Yeah, when I had to serve mass on a Wednesday morning at 6 o'clock, they got up and brought me. But they had to get five kids off to school. They didn't have time to go to mass at 6 o'clock in the morning. They had to get us fed and dressed and on the bus and make sure we had everything we needed. But we, and, we understood what sacrificial love was all about. We saw that. And so consequently, accepting, loving, believing in a God who laid down his life for our salvation, I get it. I get it. I haven't gone through life asking, why have I been fat since I'm a kid? I haven't gone through life saying, you know, how come I didn't have blonde hair, you know, a flat, 
flat stomach and a hairy chest and all the women. I didn't go through life asking that. I went through life being told that this is what God has given you. And God has been very generous. But you know, when you're a teenager and you're a kid, there's certain things. You want to be the good looking one. You want to be the popular one. You want to be the smart one. You want to be the great athlete. You want to be the great musician. I was none of those things. My brother Dennis was most of those things. But anyway, I was none of those things. But there are things that they made me realize what God did give me. And those things I have to, I have to hone and give back. <clears throat> and that understanding that we all have a responsibility in our life to recognize the sacrifice that our Lord made for us, accept the gifts that he's given us, be grateful for what we have, and find a way to return it to God. One day you'll have kids of your own. You'll understand. That's the point. One day you'll understand exactly how much we did for you. When you get to that point that one day you understand exactly how much God has sacrificed for you and how much God has given you, we quit saying, well, you know, prove to me, show me a sign, let me see where you are, God. You know, hide and seek, here we go. We quit playing hide and seek with God. We start to recognize God in the ordinary events of life. I'm able to walk, I'm able to talk. I was trainable, I was able to be educated. Everybody doesn't have that. I walk, I, I talk, I see everyone didn't have that. I have parents who love me, everybody didn't have that. I have people who sacrifice, everybody didn't have that. No, I didn't have the new cars, I didn't have the new clothes, I didn't have the travel, I didn't have the Ivy League, I didn't have that. I had so much more. I had that wonderful example. So when we start looking for God in the midst of where we live and being grateful for what is and not bitter about what never was and never will be, then we can find God. And when we can find God, we quit asking to show me a sign. What is it that you can do that you can prove to me that you're God? You woke up this morning. You were born. You walk, you talk, you see, you hear. That's gift. When we quit thinking God owes us, then we start to recognize that God is with us. That's when we're willing to sacrifice. That's where we recognize him in our midst. Thanks for being with us. May each day bring you close in your walk with the Lord. God bless you.